Hi everybody, Father Bill Holtzinger here, and this is your Friday Reflection. I'm in my office, as you can probably tell, there's a picture here and another here. Uh, this is actually an image I took of the Lagoon Nebula uh, last summer at the Oregon Star Party. I'm excited about going again. And this is an image of the Good Shepherd, something that I commissioned when I was first, uh, right before I was ordained as a deacon. And that's the sign of my priestly kind of mission or a sense of... Uh, uh, motto, which is being a good shepherd. This weekend, or last week, I should say, we experienced an ordination, and we actually had three of our parishioners, or three men, who had some connection with Holy Trinity. We had Brent Derschmidt, who was, I believe, a summer seminarian with Father Dave a long time ago, and then we had some another summer seminarian who was now Father James Ladd, and then one was more of a homegrown, and that was Father Justin Echevarria. And so Justin was just here, and I'm say this is Thursday, the 27th, and he just celebrated a daily mass for us, Father Anthony, myself, and Deacon Brett, and it was a wonderful time. A lot of people got to see him because, you know, he's from the parish. He went to our school and then went on to Jesuit, etc. Uh, and so that was wonderful. But this brings up to my mind these events of this last week or so, the things that I, I like to call it the 20 things a Catholic should either do or attend or visit. So I'm going to give you the 20 things that are a must-have or a must-see for Catholics. Number one is a priestly ordination. If you've not been bidden to an ordination, it's very important. I encourage you to go. It's every June here at the Archdiocese of Portland. And next year, it will hopefully be, God willing, uh, it'll be Chinan Vo, who is now a deacon and sent now to Medford. He'll be coming back to be ordained a priest. This is an important thing for us as people to really see what goes into the priestly life. What is the what are the vows? What is what's going on? What is he saying? What is what is the priest committing to? And you can see it all kind of wrapped up in that ceremony. It's very awesome, especially the moment where the priest, the to do be, lays on the ground before being ordained, and we hear the prayers. Uh, they we call the litany of saints. We ask them to pray for that person who'll be ordained, and then the moment of ordination where the Bishop lays his hands on his head and the anointing of oil in his hands. So priestly ordination, number one. Number two, the mass of a first mass of a priest, if you can, or within the first couple of masses. Why would I say that? Because again, this is where, you know, this is his human character, the priest, where it's kind of stumbling. I know I was in my first mass. It's been some 24 years now, but I still stumble. But for the first year priest or the first time priest, it's all so new. And this is a wonderful thing to be there to support him and just to let him know that it's okay. You can make a mess or, you know, mistake here or there. You'll fix it up and, and you'll get more comfortable. Uh, Father Justin was mentioning how he's you now had about four masses at this point. And he's slowly getting to the place where he can actually pray the mass more. Because really, we're just trying to follow the rubrics and trying to do the words and gestures. And there's a lot going on. So that's number two. Number three, attending a confirmation. If you've never been confirmed yourself, or then go to a confirmation and see what's going on where a bishop then imposes the Holy Spirit through a prayer and laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit upon the people that are coming forward to be receiving, to receive the sacrament. They've been baptized and now they are going to receive this many, many gifts, hopefully, of the Holy Spirit. That's another one. Number four would be the right of election. In the right of election, we have those who are not yet Catholics, who are not yet even baptized, who want to join the church, and they come to the bishop. And this is often at the cathedral, sometimes it's regional. Uh, and at that, that mass, then the bishop recognizes them as uh, have a certain particular state. Those who were catechumens, those are the people that are yet to be baptized, will be then given a title, the elect. And those who are already baptized, who are considered candidates, will stay the same. And it's really then a, a, a moment, a, a marker that they're very serious and the church welcomes them. They even have some status uh, in the church recognized uh, by the church as Catholics on their way, practically. Yeah. And then the next one, that'd be number five, would be the would be Palm Sunday. Some things hopefully you've seen and been to, but uh, some of the parishes they'll have uh, a ritual where they have the the liturgy of the word, the gospel read, and then there's a procession. I've even heard where they actually have the priest on a donkey. <laughs> That's a little bit difficult, a little bit tricky. Um, that's something to experience. And of course, then the palms that get blessed and are waved and et cetera. So that's a wonderful Mass. Another one would be Holy Thursday Mass, the institution 
of the priesthood and the Eucharist. This is a time where there is the washing of the feet, uh, and you may actually be. Maybe you've been part of that. The, yeah. Generally speaking, uh, we try to get people from the various ministries here at Holy Trinity, and I will wash their feet as a sign of what Jesus did that was to serve them. And they're called, as we all are as Christians, to serve. Of course, then the Eucharist is offered in a very special way. And then there could be a procession of that Eucharist to another location where there can be adoration that follows. Again, that's the Holy Thursday Mass. Next would be Good Friday, number seven, Good Friday service. Not a Mass, though communion is offered, it's really a time to have an extended set of the reflection of the Passion of Christ. Where And, and it's similar to, by the way, uh, Palm Sunday, an extended version of the right reading of the Passion of Christ. And in this case, uh, it is done possibly at your parish in a dialogue form where different people have roles that can be done also at Palm Sunday Mass. But on Good Friday, it's typically done from the Gospel of John only, where the other ones move through the different Gospels through a cycle. Number eight is the Easter Vigil Mass. We at Holy Trinity try to make sure that it's accessible to everybody. I know the Easter Vigil Mass can be long, it can be late, etc. And I want to hope to encourage you that to maybe then sleep in, but make an effort in your parish to go. Here we do it again a little earlier and we really want to make sure that people can go, and they do, and we have a pretty good uh, turnout. That In that Mass, we see then the extended version of, we'll say, the readings of the Liturgy of the Word, kind of the, uh, uh, a step-by-step -step set of readings that have the story of us Christians, of, to the Jewish people, how God has interacted with us. Salvation history is what we actually call it. And after each reading is a psalm and a prayer, a reading, a psalm, and a prayer, and there's several of them, till you get to the gospel. After the gospel, then comes a homily brief, as it might be, and then the baptism. Depend on where you are, the baptisms might be done on a pouring, maybe there's a bowl there. At other parishes and some of the ones I've been at, we actually did full immersion baptisms. If you've not seen that, that's something to be seen. Followed by confirmation and First Holy Communion. It's like the whole meal deal. They receive these sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, and Holy Communion. That's number eight. And number nine, of course, is Sunday Mass on Easter. This is one of these things that's considered the precepts of the church, but it is a wonderful celebration. Often in that Mass, an extra ritual replacing the penitential act is one of sprinkling rite. And we have some large uh, things that we use to kind of sprinkle the water because it's hard to get through the, you know, foot to the people, to the pews. And let's just say it's a rather wet experience, but it's fun. And it's a reminder of our baptism. Following in that, of course, the Easter Sunday, we have the Eucharist, and we are reminded especially of the greatest of all the things that Jesus ever did was rising from the dead. He sucked for us. We see that on Good Friday and rose from the dead for our salvation and opened the gates of heaven for us. It's the greatest. Following that service would be then Christmas Eve or Christmas Day and the Christmas Eve Mass. Some people like the Christmas Eve Mass, the, the one at midnight. Some prefer morning is... Uh, time, whatever it might be. But this, again, is one of those the precepts that Easter and Christmas are masses that the churches really want to push because these are the amazing things from the beginning of his incarnation and becoming flesh, becoming human, to the time where he sacrifices his flesh, his whole person, to the Lord. That's number nine. Or excuse me, it's number ten. Eleven. Eleven is, this is my, again, one of the 20 things to go to is if you were a Catholic church, or a Catholic uh, person, is to go to a dedication of a new church. Our church here was dedicated in 2001, but be mindful within the archdiocese or diocese you may be at, there may be new churches coming and being built. Make an effort to go to one of those. Before you die, this is one of those things. It'd be wonderful as you see, there's a lot of ritual where the church itself is blessed. There's four pillars or parts of the church that get anointed, and then amazingly, the church altar and gets consecrated. The chrism oil gets poured all over it, and the bishop moves his hands and wipes it all over there and uh, consecrates the altar and dedicates it. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Number 12 is the initial or final profession of a person really, uh, joining a religious community, whether it be Benedictine, Franciscan, whatever it be. Uh, if you know that, it happens almost every year, depending on the community. And, and just be mindful, sometime it would be great to see that. And notice the comparisons of similarities and differences than an ordination. Number 13, attend a Vespers or what they call evening prayer at a religious community. Go wherever you think you need to go because that will be a very wonderful thing to participate in. A Mass 
at the cathedral, uh, wherever your diocese is. In our case, it's the Immaculate Conception, Mary the Immaculate Conception. At least if you've not gone to the cathedral for a, ma a mass, go to a Sunday mass sometime and just experience. It's a little different, it's a little more formal. It's kind of the archetype for a lot of the masses, a lot of parishes. They can do things that we, you know, parishes don't necessarily do, but it's good to see and be there because often the bishop himself will be the one celebrating mass, but not always. Uh, if it's not him, it'd be the rector of the cathedral or his parochial vicar, assistant priest. Number 15, pick a pilgrimage and go to Rome, go to Vatican City, go to St. Peter's Basilica, St. John's uh, the Lateran Cathedral, that's the Pope's actual cathedral. The St. Peter's is actually a, a huge church, of course, the largest church in the world, where he is often there because of just the populace and many people there. Where St. John Lateran, which is huge, it's not as big as St. Peter's Basilica. Number 16, I mentioned it earlier, is going to the grotto. Going to the grotto. Just here in Portland, if you're from the Archdiocese of Portland, go to the grotto. There's a wonderful place there to be able to pray, do Stations of the Cross. Sometimes they even have Mass outside. Uh, it's a beautiful church. I recommend that. Number 17, go to Mount Angel Abbey. Now, I'm biased because that's where I went to school. But since I've left, they've done a lot of renovation of uh, their buildings and the grounds. And that allows it for a wonderful, beautiful space to be able to walk and pray and even possibly go on a retreat. Number 18, Our Lady of Guadalupe Abbey. They're the, uh, you could say, the reformed version of the Benedictines, the Trappists. And they have a very beautiful modern uh, church where they give, uh, you know, they have their mass. In fact, if you go to one of their masses, check it out. Watch how slow they go. They're very contemplative. It's beautiful and wonderful. Number 19 is Our Lady of Peace Retreat Center. So if you're here locally from Beaverton, check that out because they also have a, a wonderful retreat center. They have a bookstore there and, and they have a chapel you can go and visit and pray. I invite you to do that. And finally, number 20. You know what number 20 is? Well, I want you to come up with number 20, actually. Fill that in. In fact, put it in the comments if you can. What is one place that a priest, or I should say, a, a Catholic should go to to visit, or a place or an event that a Catholic really should uh, participate in sometime in their life? I want to thank you for watching, and I'll see you this weekend. I believe, Deacon, let's see, Father Anthony is preaching. Next week after this, I will be preaching. And may God bless you, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.